Um, I'm Max Parker. I'm the Vice President of Operations for Zimmerman Marine. Uh, I've been with Zimmerman Marine for 23 years now, I think. I started out painting bottoms and scraping barnacles and worked as a tech for quite a few years and worked as a, the scheduler and a service coordinator and the yard manager and, and operations manager. And I've been uh, vice president now for a couple of years. Uh, just in this shameless plug uh, <laughs> thought, uh, Zebra Marine has seven locations now. We just opened up a location in Solomons uh, to the south a little bit. Uh, our, we became an ESOP two years ago, so we're employee-owned. I actually own more of the company than Steve Zimmerman, who started it, <laughs> which has been fun, uh, learning everything that he did to make it what it is, and, and, uh, and our plan is just to keep growing and trying to help people up and down the East Coast and solve problems for folks so they can have fun out on the water. Uh, when I do these things, they, it seems like they always go better if people ask questions. And so don't be bashful if you got a specific question. If you see something that we're talking about and you want to ask, we'll, we'll do that. We'll try to keep things moving along. And if something's super complicated, we'll come back to it. I'll probably talk about your question as we go along, but I don't mind if you ask questions. So what are we trying to solve here? Um, what's corrosion and why should I care? What is bonding? And do I need it? Can other boats or marina wiring cause corrosion on my boat? Will I fall asleep during the presentation? <laughs> I hope not. It's, uh, it is early in the morning. I don't know what you did last night. Um, so there's a bunch of different types of corrosion. Uh, galvanic, straight current, crevice corrosion, pitting corrosion. One thing that's not on the list is electrolysis. Um, a lot of people use that as a catchphrase, but I don't know if you remember high school science, you can stick two poles of a, a, of a, a battery into water and it'll make hydrogen. That's electrolysis or laser hair or hair removal is also electrolysis. So not the type of uh, corrosion that we're going to talk about. No? Okay. Thank you. All right. So... Galvanic corrosion is the first thing we're going to talk about. And, and basically, if you have one metal that's more noble than another metal, and they're connected by a wire, and they're dropped into an electrolyte, which is seawater, then the, uh, the, the anodic uh, side, the least noble side, is going to send electrons to the more noble side, to the cath cathode. So uh, I always... I think about, there was an Italian at the turn of the century named uh, 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 Galvani, and he did all these studies on, uh, on frog's legs where he connected dissimilar metals and electrolyte and he touched the frog's legs and the frog leg would jump. And so he learned a lot about dissimilar metals. Uh, Volta was also there at the same time they talked, and one of the things I in researching this in the past, I discovered is that Mary Shelley also was aware of uh, Galvani's work, and so she uh, used that to create Frankenstein's monster, and I think that's kind of neat how that all came about. <laughs> Which, I mean, if, if you've got corrosion on your boat, you might think it's a Frankenstein of sorts. So, uh, uh, over time, and now, I mean, again, this is uh, turn of the century, turn of 17th uh, to 18th. So uh, they figured out over time that there's least active metals over here, which are the more noble ones, and the most active over here. And you'll notice zinc, and you'll notice aluminum, um, and then over here in the coppers, that's where our bronzes are going to fall, which or, you know, it's a really good metal for a boat. Um, so you've got to be aware of where these different things fall on the scale because when they're in electrolyte in, in seawater, they are going to want to corrode. So bronze is, uh, of course, an uh, uh, excellent metal in that regard. Uh, we've got an we've got a old uh, wooden boat that actually started the yard called Rosa that, that Steve Zimmerman actually sailed on when he was in college. And, 
That boat's filled with bronze sea cots now. It's 65 years old, I think, at this point. And the, the through hulls all look great. I mean, it's, it's a very long-lived metal. Um, in, with that regard, uh, there can be a lot of other metals or alloys of bronze. Uh, brasses, in particular, don't make good underwater metals because brass has a lot more zinc in it. And it makes a lot harder. But, and so it, it works well for, for plumbing, it's very machinable, but when you put it in seawater, that zinc is going to uh, go away and it becomes very brittle, uh, worse so than what bronze does. So typical bronze composition is 85% uh, copper, 5% lead, 5% tin, 5% zinc. All right, so back to this thought again. Um, we're, we're uh, uh, where was I going to go? Let me go to the next one here. Okay, so bronze uh, with, is uh, uh, propellers are uh, nickel aluminum bronze, which uh, is a lot harder than just uh, regular bronze, uh, but it is a different composition um, that, that gives it more strength, uh, working well as a propeller material. Again, it's still got copper, it's still got uh, zinc in it. This propeller is beginning to turn pink, you can see. And part of that is it lost its zinc for some period of time. Um, so as the alloy starts to leach out those metals, it's gonna, it's gonna lose some of its strength as the alloy starts to degrade. This particular one was out of zinc uh, for several years, and uh, you know it, it, it really has become so so brittle that when they ran the boat, it lost a blade. Um, pretty significant corrosion risk. Here we go. This is a uh, part of the through hole installation in which the. Uh, the, the through hole itself has, has lost uh, a great deal of zinc and has become very pink. Now, I'll come back to through holes again uh, a little bit in a minute. Uh, this is not a great way to do a through hole, and uh, I'll, I'll show you a better way here in a minute. Uh, this is showing the difference between a, a, a good through hole and one that's turned pink, uh, you can see the, how the, the zinc is actually leaving the metal. Again, all because there's no zinc on the, on the protecting this system. All right, so uh, that's galvanic corrosion. Let's move towards straight current. Um, straight current along, it's a similar process, but what's going on is there's actually a, a DC source that's pushing even more of those electrons out. So at some point in the system, uh, the, the, there's a battery, or uh, it's usually a battery, that's uh, dumping DC current into the bonding system. So it's really uh, accelerating the, the corrosion. This particular through hole, you can see it was at, right at the water line, so there was seawater in there, um, but uh, within the bonding system, uh, there was a fault, and so massive amounts of, of metal are being lost. Strength current is almost always DC aboard a boat, um, so marina wiring is rarely a corrosion issue, but it is a safety issue for swimmers, for sure. Now, there, there's, there's been a lot of talk over the years about whether or not AC can cause corrosion on boats. Uh, we do occasionally see a, a big AC fault where you'll, you'll sometimes you'll get paint uh, rings. Uh, you'll see them when the through holes, uh, when the boat's hauled out, the paint's missing in, in areas around the through hole. Um, that's typically a, an AC problem but not always. Um, it, and again, that somewhat depends on the paint that's being used. If it's a real heavy copper paint and there's an electrical issue, 
um, the, the copper in the paint can actually fall off. Um, I've also seen that issue with, with uh, a bad AC fault, although it just takes a lot longer. It's a lot less uh, 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 possible. Well, so, yes, sir. So uh, there's no metal that's immune to uh, straight current? No metal. Um, well, I mean, if you go more noble, you know, gold is up there at the top. Uh, but nobody's making boat parts out of gold. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, it's it's more noble, so it's less uh, prone to corrosion than that something that's less noble than it. Um, and again, it depends on the amount of current that's flowing through things. So you push enough current through. Uh, through the bonding system, then uh, any metal will corrode. So, so there is no, no metal that's immune to it? Not that I'm aware of. So, so you, you referenced the danger to swimmers. There is a 12 volt. Is it truly dangerous to swimmers with DC current? No, not DC. Not DC. I'll, I'll come back around to AC. Um, the reason this picture is in here is because uh, We've got to think about ways that DC could get into the, the bonding system. So uh, if a bilge pump float switch goes up and down and goes up and goes down and goes up and down and the wire becomes chafed at the up and down point, then every time that comes up, there's you know DC current flowing through that. If there's water in the bilge, it'll travel through the water in the bilge and it'll find some other piece of metal that's in the bilge, and then it, that starts the circuit. The, the positive DC is going to try to get back to the battery by any means it can. That's, that's one thing that's interesting about electricity to me is it'll, like, even though there may be a really good path for the electricity to go back, if there's any other path, it's going to take that as well. So, um, you know, even if it's a high resistance connection, it's still gonna try to go through that as well. And when we get to AC, I mean, we're actually, I don't know what percentage salt water is in our blood, but we're pretty good conductors too. So if there's an AC fault and you, and you touch a live wire and you touch a, a grounded wire, current's gonna flow through you. Same thing happens when you're in the water. If there is an AC field trying to get back to the, to the grounding rod on the shore where the electrical box is, you know, you're in the way, you're part of that conductive surface or cir circuit. And, uh, and actually that's why people, their, their limbs freeze up and they can't breathe and their heart stops. Um, I got ahead of myself, but it's an interesting question. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, some other things that, that can cause uh, DC leaks, uh, 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 like VHF radios are notorious for the the uh, uh, the conduct the I'm sorry the the coaxial lines as they leave the radio for your antenna if that insulation breaks down when you key the mic it may be touching the mast or it might touch some other metal uh, device inside the boat and that can send current through certainly any kind of uh, uh, wire that gets penetrated by a screw we had a boat that uh, came in and, and had a massive uh, problem with corrosion under the boat. And what we discovered is when a windlass had been installed on the bow and the high amperage cables had run up, one of them, also some work had been done on the tow rail where they added a cleat. And when they drilled for the cleat, they drilled into the wire and then the bolt went into the wire. So every time the windlass was hit, it was electrifying the, the handrail which was tied to the bonding system. And, uh, and so that was dumping, you know, quite a bit of current at that point. Um, so, you know, and then faults, all right? So we're big believers in the ABYC and the, the standards that they've written and try really hard to follow them whenever possible and point out problems wherever they occur. And uh, so one of the things they're really big on is that you don't wrap electrical connections with electrical tape, you know, instead of using a proper crimp connection and heat shrink and sealing out the water. 
if that connection was underwater, every time that pump went off, you know, it would dump DC current into the bilge water and cause an issue. Um, the sealing off connections so that they don't corrode is very important. Uh, preventing water contact and connections is important. Good, like keeping wiring from jiggling around. You know, the uh, ABYC says you should uh, uh, connect a wire every 16 inches. You know, it's got to have a wire tie so that as the boat is shaking around, those wires don't become loose and don't chafe and, and don't get to the point where they're going to be a problem. All right, let's go on. All right, so crevice corrosion is a different type of problem. These are both stainless steel prop shafts, and you can see the way the corrosion's working. And you might say, um, you know, stainless steel, this is like a super metal, right? It, you stick it out in the weather, and it doesn't rust, and it, it lasts a really long time. It's more expensive. It's like crazy expensive. If you buy fasteners lately, you know how much you're paying for them. Um, why is it corroding? Well, stainless only works when it's exposed to oxygen. It actually develops a, a protective layer on the outside surface, and that's what gives it that corrosion resistance. If you remove that oxygen, then it can freely corrode. We'll go back to the scale again. So here's active stainless steel. And here's passive stainless steel. So you can see active is when it's been reduced from the oxygen. And where might that occur? All right, so if you're underneath the water, you're using a stainless steel bolt in your swim platform down at the bottom, it's underwater all the time. Um, that, if the sealant starts to go, now water's getting in there, it's got no oxygen, and that fastener will just basically rust, you know, it's, it's a form of rust of sorts. So uh, many times we've pulled this, those bolts out of a swim platform and they're just wasp wasted, you know, they'll be down to a point. Sometimes you just pull the point off um, because it's just crudding away. The bronze is a much better metal in that application. Same thing for a strut bolt or uh, you know, it's less of an issue if you've got like outside strainer, like a bronze strainer, and you want to use stainless screws in that, that aspect. But still, bronze is probably better. Um, so uh, uh, the other big one, I'm sorry, go ahead. I don't even see bronze on that. Now, I know bronze is not a metal, it's an alloy, but where would it fit? It's, it's right here in the copper realm. Okay. Um, yeah, a little bit higher than magnums. Bronze. The silicon bronze is typically what we're wanting to see. In. So it's between naval brass and copper, or copper and brass? Uh, it's actually, I'm sorry, it's a little bit above brass, like in this area. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the, does this show it? Yeah. So uh, again, another uh, prop shaft. If a boat sits and sits and sits and sits and sits, uh, in the stuffing box, uh, in the shaft tube of the stuffing box, there's water in there. And if that water, you know, sits forever and it never gets used and it never gets flushed out, it'll become deoxygenated over time. And it's the kind of thing that, you know, for most boats, you know, we, the, the, you can't ever see it unless you go to do shaft work. Um, you know, if you, if, you know, what happens in a lot of cases is uh, a cutlass bearing will finally fail. You know, they last a good long time if the boat's, if the engine's in alignment. So we'll go to replace a cutlass bearing, and in order to do that, the shaft has to come out, and then you see that the, sh the shaft has corrosion like this going on. Um, it's something that we always try to say, hey, look, you know, cutlass bearing might be, I don't know, eight hours to replace, plus you need an engine alignment. But if the shaft is bad, you know, then we'll have to talk about it and get pricing on that as well. One of the things that uh, boat builders have tried to do is, you know, what do, what do we need to do to make shafts last longer? And there's some better grades of stainless called aqua alloy or um, uh, there's another version like that or nibral. Um, 
that have more molybdenum in them and uh, more chromium in them. And so they, they tend to be less uh, corrosive in that application. They last longer, it's worth paying that money for them uh, if you're going to all the trouble of having a new shaft made. Uh, and in the old days, we saw quite a few bronze shafts. The problems with bronze is that it, it's a much softer metal and, and at the stuffing box itself, uh, you'll end up with additional wear. So there's a, a limit of time that you can run them before the, the, the stuffing box will wear the shaft away. Yes, sir. Credits for corrosion, what do you do for stuff like uh, um, bedding? Can you use a stainless steel screw and a bedding compound? So the, the bedding will isolate it for a good long time. And, and so for something like a strainer on, under the boat, yeah. you know, you're changing it fairly frequently to clean it. And so, you know, there's usually not an issue with that, but if you've got a 40 year old boat and the strainers never come off, you probably, when you go to take the head of the screw out, it'll leave the, the shank of it in it. What about for like turnbuckles or anything? Would you recommend using something like a, a lana coat or something that, so I can take it apart later on? Well, turnbuckles are above the deck, so they're being exposed to oxygen all the time, but certainly lana coat or, uh, Super lube or something like that on the threads of the turnbuckle is a smart thing to do. Is that to, not going to take the oxygen away? No, no, the lubrication is fine. It, it, if it's isolating it, it's a different matter than if it's uh, trapping moisture in it. So, if you, it is one point. Um, if you take your turnbuckles to keep the cotter pins in them from catching on something, you want to make sure that you leave a way for the water to get out. You know the upper. Uh, turnbuckle hole, I guess, for lack of a better words, is people want to tape the whole thing. And I've taken those apart before and just had water pour out. That's not a good situation. Um, it's much better if they leak out. Yes, ma'am. So you mentioned the swim platform uh, and the uh, issue with the, uh, the, the screw. Mm -hmm. When does it become, um, you know, time on the issue? When does that become? It's a really good point, um, and it's as good a time as any. So, we had this conversation quite a bit of how long does bedding last, um, and Generally, you know, I've talked to Cicaflex, I've talked to 3M, I was like, you know, how long does your bedding last? And of course, they're going to say, how well was it installed in the first place? But uh, if it was done properly and the right solvent was used to clean it up, it's somewhere 15, 20 years you can usually get out of, out of bedding. Um, so, you know, if the boat was installed with stainless steel uh, fasteners under the water line, um, I'd probably start looking at it 15 to 20 years. It might be time to start doing that. And, you know, this is true of the whole boat. And, and so I don't want to, I don't want to say that everybody needs to go out and bed everything on their 20 year old boat right now. But, you know, what we usually say is, you know, draw up a map of the boat, you know, draw up where the different fasteners are and, you know, every year or every two years, let's do this section, and then let's do this section, and then let's do this section, and kind of get on a, a rolling program of, of renewing the bedding on the boat. I, you know, what a lot of people do is, you know, I'm starting to get leaks, you know, now it's time to start looking at it. At that point, you know, it's more uh, like you want to do it on an accelerated time frame, right? Because you'll end up with problems inside the boat as well. Yeah. Have, there, have there been studies on uh, any coating systems that uh, would isolate the shaft from uh, deoxygenated water? Not in my knowledge. Um, you know, I partly because of the where it has to uh, have contact with a cutlass bearing or with the um, with the stuffing box. Um, there are systems out there that are that are a tube that's oil filled with bearings inside of it. So uh, 
from the, they don't have a conventional stuffing box. They've got lip seals inside the boat and then lip seals outside the boat and bearings inside that are in an oil bath. So you're not, there's no seawater in that section of the, of the shaft. Um, yeah, but, Uh, it, it may be yeah, I I don't know how you do that where the bearing material, you know, wouldn't wear away, and I, I haven't heard of that being done. You know. it, one of the things that's kind of I should say while we're in this part, um, you know, obviously you can see there's a pit here, but what you can't see is that sometimes we've cut these open before and they look like ant hills inside of them, so depending on you know how much the alloy was mixed up as it was poured you might end up with some different metals and you know it's not completely mixed like it needs to in the alloying process so if there happened to be a little bit more copper in one spot and that's you know deteriorating in that way uh, then you know this is a time to replace the shaft yes sir my shaft coupling has four bolts three of them are stainless steel and one of them is mild steel is there a purpose to that Shaft couplings should really be um, uh, grade eight bolts, not stainless steel. Okay. The st stainless is too soft in that application. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if, if you guys are familiar with how you tell uh, if it's a grade eight bolt or not. So if you look at a hex head, it'll have a number of tick marks all the way around it. So um, grade eight bolts have six tick marks. Lesser grade bolts have fewer tick marks in them. So they're in a shaft coupling application, you want the strongest uh, you know, joint that you can get. What's one tick mark? It's like mild steel. Yeah. I, I, I could be wrong, but I think stainless has three ticks maybe, um, but it's just not, it's not strong enough for, I mean, it obviously, you know, it may have been on your boat for 30 years. And if, everything we say is like, well, it's been on my boat for 30 years and it hadn't broken yet. I'm just, I'm saying what the standard is and you know, you can obviously, if it works for that long, it's hard to say that it didn't work, right? So a tick mark is one of the raised, like a, a dash uh, perpendicular to the side? Yeah, yeah, it kind of points at the, at the points of the hex as it goes around. A little bit more. So Aquamet um, does come in different uh, compositions uh, with the 22 being the, the best and the most expensive. I have priced out different shafts before and you know, depending on the length of the shaft, it's usually a fairly negligible difference when you're thinking about something that you don't wanna replace again for 20 or 30 years. I, I would recommend going with lesser grades. Uh, It's, it's, it's the proprietary name for shafting that this brand of more corrosion resistant shaft material. Another version of that's aqua alloy and uh, nibral. Sometimes you'll hear about running rigging, uh, like uh, rod rigging is made out of nibral. They're all basically the same composition of uh, or alloy. Um, but this is, this is steel with this combination. Stainless steel, yes. Yeah, but just more corrosion resistant. Uh, if I remember correctly, Aquamat 17 is more similar to 316 uh, stainless, if you're familiar with that number. What's per, and I thought nitrogen was a gas. Uh, I, they use it in the, um, in the forming process. Really? Per is a, uh, how hard it is. It's a, a measure of if it'll scratch or not. That's uh, just one more thing while we're on this topic of corrosion. If, because stainless steel becomes stainless by exposure to oxygen, if you clamp that really highly polished shaft, say with a pair of vice grips, somebody doesn't know what they're doing, they're putting little tips in it, right? Um, so those dents, also um, are points where the oxygen doesn't get in there as well and they can be a point where it starts corroding. Um, it's, uh, it's really better to uh, have that shaft as polished as it can be. Yes, ma'am. My shaft is coated, painted. 
Under the water? Yep. Uh-huh. Um, Is that good or bad? It's, it's good because it'll, it'll reduce the amount of uh, marine growth. Right. Yeah. So that, that's, it, that won't hurt the um, stainless at all. Um, it's actually a good thing because if you get barnacles growing on it, the barnacles are preventing uh, oxygen in the water from reaching it. You can, I've seen shafts that have sat for a really long time with lots of barnacles on them and you'll get a little pit underneath each barnacle cap. So um, it is better. I mean, it's going to be better for your performance too because you're not dragging all those barnacles around. Uh, yeah. So 17 uh, meets the standards, the specs? Um, so, I mean, so you can make a shaft out of 17. They, they are sold. They're just not as corrosion resistant. So it's, it, in my mind, the, the amount of money less that it costs isn't worth the, the uh, possibility of s sooner corrosion, basically. Uh, it takes, I mean, it's, you put a shaft in a boat, you want to think that it's going to be there for the life, sure. you know, that you've owned it. So... Uh, in my mind, I would not want to put a 17 in and then, you know, five years down the way, discover that it, it had, you know, shrunken in size in the stuffing box. There are other parameters with this material too, like 17 may be a lower strength than 22. Uh, Strength-wise, uh, you know, that's a good question. Um, I'm sure there's probably a table that talks about the difference in strength. Um, I don't think that the, the per rating, that's more how easily it is to scratch. So it's making it harder. And it may be that the harder it is, the less strong it is, but I, I can't say that with, with certainty. I'd have to look that up. Um, I'm, you know, certainly uh, the 22 series metals are, um, you know, the industry standard. All high-end boats are using 22. You know, there was a series, there was a period of time when uh, quite a few of the boats that were built in the Far East were using stainless 304 shafts, and actually a lot of the material metals in the boats, the tankage and and the uh, chain plates and things like that, were not 316; they were 304. Um, and actually, there's an issue with with uh, stainless steel tanks, and that if you don't use the right welding rod on them, uh, that They've got to be a low carbon welding rod as well, or you'll end up with weld migration, and, and that's also a rust corrosion point inside the boat. Uh, I suppose that falls in the marine corrosion field. It's, it's not something I have a picture of, but uh, uh, those we, what we were seeing is after you know 20 years and the cutlass bearings worn out, we pull those shafts, and, and they're very uh, magnetic. Uh, much more magnetic than an aqua alloy, so they've got more iron in them, and that's uh, you know an indication that they're they're uh, why they corroded faster than what you would expect. All right, so what are we going to do to protect all these metals? Uh, my favorite chart. So we're down at this end where there's things that are very least noble, most anodic. That ends most, mostly cathodic. So um, if we have a zinc or an aluminum alloy or magnesium attached to the metal in the boat, then it's going to corrode first, which is a good thing, right? So we, we, we're putting something on there as a sacrifice that's going to go away so that the metal that we want to keep good stays good. So zinc is one, aluminum is another. Mag there are some magnesium zincs out there. So let's just talk about uh, what's going on right now in the world. Five years ago, six years ago, ten years ago, we did, we always talked about putting new zincs on boats. You know, the the industry standard was that uh, zinc would protect everything and it became ubiquitous. Like even to this day, when we're putting aluminum anodes on boats, a lot of times we're calling it a zinc, just, you know. But what we have learned is that uh, there's some real benefits to aluminum um, and some negatives to zinc. The zinc actually is more toxic to marine life 
Um, I, I've even saw, seen things that say it's more uh, can cancerous or cancer causing. Um, aluminum alloys are a little bit less expensive. They work better in uh, less salty water. So um, brackish water and uh, fresh water, it's actually gonna protect. Zinc doesn't quite as much or very little in fresh water. Um, Maryland is a state, there's been uh, quite a bit of talk about banning zinc altogether. It's, they've been talking about it for I don't know, five or six years now. I, I don't think it's actually gone that way, but if you go to West Marine and look in the bin, you know, there are more and more and more aluminum zincs, <laughs> aluminum anodes, um, and less and less zinc anodes these days. So you won't hurt a thing on your boat if you put aluminum on. It, and actually, I'd recommend putting aluminum on. It's, I know it is, like I'm, I live down in Deltaville and we're closer to the mouth of the bay where it's a little bit uh, saltier down there. Um, but it's fairly fresh up here, right? Is it still salty at all, or salty. is it pretty salty? Well, um, I don't. I I know I took a trip up the Potomac one time, and the, the Potomac gets pretty fresh when you get close to D.C. Um, the zinc wouldn't do a lot of good there, where aluminum would still protect the boat. Yes, ma'am. It is. It is. It will protect now. What we will find is if you you want to have all the zincs, <laughs> this is such a, it's ingrained in my head, you want to have all the aluminum anodes, the same material in your boat. You don't want to have some zinc and some aluminum. They need to be all the same material. They don't make um, the end cap out of aluminum. I have a sail drive that I have two collars that were aluminum, but the end cap was zinc because they didn't make it. That's interesting. Um, how long is, has it worked well for years? It hasn't worked well for years. Um, zinc is gone. Yeah. Okay. I would think that like the aluminum is actually going to corrode quicker than the zinc. And you actually, um, like I've seen boats that we haul every year and when they had zincs on them, there'd be, I don't know, 85% of the zinc left after a year where the aluminum, it might be 50% of it. Like it's, it is more, reactive, it is protecting better, it's more electrically active. Um, so the, the question of that, that that's interesting. Uh, I haven't run into an issue where I couldn't find an aluminum version. There are, um, there are maybe resources we could talk about that, that you haven't been familiar with yet that maybe we can find one that is an aluminum for what your application is. We'll see. I'm pretty sure MaxProp has aluminum zincs. But anyway, we'll get back to that. Yes, sir. So you say that uh, zinc, all zinc, or not the zincs in the engine and then the heat exchangers? So um, inside the boat, while you could say that it's all connected with salt water and it's, it's all in the current path, um, it's actually more of an isolated environment and it's fine to have zincs on the engine. If there's aluminum outside the engine, it won't cause a problem in that. You know, you're protecting your, uh, your heat exchanger um, and that's enough of a closed circuit you know, that it's not an issue. Yes? So um, that has come up a couple of times. Actually, one of our techs here named Mike Kanye, I don't know if any of you guys have met him yet, he did quite a bit of research on the problem, specifically with Volvo uh, heat exchangers, and uh, he discovered a, uh, a plumbing fitting made out of bronze that actually has a port for a zinc, and he's been adding those to quite a few uh, uh, Volvo heat exchangers uh, the results, I, the first one he did was a couple years ago and it came back and um, one of the things with the Volvo heat exchangers is where the uh, end cap is, um, there can be corrosion in that area where it goes out, the exhaust outlet, and that's solved that problem. 
um, because the anode is protecting it. It's not the, there's like copper rods inside the heat exchanger and the dissimilar metals between the aluminum of the heat exchanger and the copper rods inside of it were causing an electrical reaction. So it may be something to... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny too because, you know, we've known about this for, you know, since uh, Volta and uh, Galvani were talking about it, right? So why would a major engine manufacturer make a heat exchanger out of aluminum and put copper in it and not put a zinc on it? And a marine engine, right? I, yeah, I can't explain it, but there is a solution. Yeah. yeah. How, how do you know what material your anode is actually moving in? Is there a code on it, or do you have to look at the bin? Um, you know, the bin is a good guide. I think they've got little markings on them that, uh, that say whether they're aluminum or zinc. Um, you didn't mention magnesium, so that happened, right? Well, no, magnesium, if you're like, you know, none of us is really dealing solely with fresh water, but magnesium does get used in pure freshwater boats on lakes and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, because it's more reactive and the, the, uh, the fresh water has less salt in it, which is more conductive. So um, the, uh, you, you need more uh, voltage potential to push the, the corrosion resistance. Yes. Our cruise plan for this year includes about two months here and then a month in salt water and then about six in fresh. Yes. So I, I, I think our plan is to go to aluminum. Do I need to worry about that month that we're in salt water? Um, aluminum will, will protect you in salt and fresh. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it works very well for both applications. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, there's some aluminum paint that's available that you can paint on your propeller, and uh, I'm wondering how that interact, potentially interacts with the, your anodes. If there is a, more, a less noble anode than the paint, then the anode will still protect the coating. So, I mean, the, the, in some ways, the anode is also, you know, you're putting copper on your bottom with a lot of bottom paints, so anode's also working for that as well, or a lead keel or, you know, whatever the, the other metal components are. Is there a, uh, are, there, are there different types of aluminum, or is this pure aluminum that we're uh, Oh, well, the, the aluminum anodes are a uh, uh, aluminum iridium alloy. alloy. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like... Uh, you know the the uh, the aluminum of your mast. It's it's meant to corrode. Yes, sir. The body system on our boat is tied to a pair of zinc anodes that are bolted off the transom. Yes. And they're bolted into the boat with stainless steel bolts. Yes. We've noticed that those zincs yes. are not corroding. The ones on the prop shaft, for example, corrode a lot. I'm wondering if the stainless steel bolt is isolating those zincs from the bonding system. Um, it's a really good question. Um, actually, uh, we're, we're going to, let me fast forward here. Uh, I've kind of talked about some of this stuff already, so let me keep going. Uh, you can follow what, where we are, we'll get caught up. <laughs> Yeah, don't mix anodes. Okay, let's get to bonding. So we're back to the more active, less active metal. We're going to talk about this connection right now and why it's important. Um, here's your, your plate zinc question. Um, you know, again, we're, we're kind of, there's a couple of things that could be going on. Uh, stainless isn't uh, as good a conductor as copper, for one thing. So a bronze bolt in, in that application is better. Not to mention that the bronze bolt, you know, isn't going to have the crevice corrosion issues when the bedding fails. Um, it and if the if the bedding is starting to fail, then then it's all the more reason because it's a hole underneath the water line that you don't want to have leak. Um, so a lot of good reason for that. Plus inside the boat, and this is the back side of that application. You got well, actually these are stainless, but you. Uh, uh, you got to make sure that the connection of the bonding system is good to one of those bolts so that it's making a, a connection. So basically, 
Uh, we want to make sure that every metal that's immersed in seawater on the boat has a good electrical connection. So ABYC has said that that needs to be less than one ohm of resistance. Everybody have a multimeter on their boat for troubleshooting and stuff? I mean, they're so handy. So there's a, uh, a setting on most multimeters uh, of resistance. It looks like an upside down U. And um, if you connect it to uh, you know, one part of the bonding system and then another part of the bonding system, you should have less than one ohm of resistance between the two. So uh, can you all hear that? So I've got a perfect connection right now. There's no resistance or very little, and you can hear the, the multimeter ring. Oh, you can hear it ring. You hear that? So uh, it's, if you're curious why one zinc isn't working and another one is, you can go through the boat and, and check between one point and another point, and then that point and the next point, and that point and the next point, and uh, make sure that each of those connections is, uh, is sound. The, uh, a lot of times what will happen is they'll be chained together and so you'll have a point in the chain from the back to the front of the boat that's broken and so everything forward isn't being protected at all or, or some version of that. Yes, sir? Can you do that in the water or does that be out of the water? You can do it in the water, yeah. I mean, it is easy if the boat is out because you can go outside the boat and look at the through holes and, you know, I, I love the idea of everybody having a, a spool of old wire with a couple of alligator clips on it. Um, it's useful for so much troubleshooting on, on a board, on a boat. Um, so if you take, a, you know, one of the alligator clips and you clip it to one part of your multimeter, have somebody hold it on the zinc bolt and then, or clip it on the zinc bolt and then you use the other side of the multimeter and you touch each of your through holes, you can check and see that it's part of, you know, the bonding system's intact. Yes. So you're talking about bonding systems. So my boat, some things are bonded and some are not. I thought they all had to be or all not. Um, in the United States, um, U.S. built boats of a certain year, they should all be bonded. Um, EU doesn't have the same standards, and so a lot of the big uh, manufacturers, French in particular, don't have bonding systems, um, and what what we've discovered over here is that a bonding system has more than one positive application. Not only is it keeping all the underwater metals at the same potential so that they can be protected by anode, but it's also really handy if there's a problem with the AC system on the boat. If you're if something and I'll get to this in a second. I, I'd love to get ahead of myself, but uh, the, if you had uh, one of the hot wires on your AC system touch part of the bonding system, now every piece of metal is going to be electrified at the same point, and it's going to try to carry that back to shore, where if you don't have that and you touch like a tank or something that, that's not connected to the bonding system, then you know, you're going to make a better path. So the, the bonding system helps with AC faults, it also, um, it's, it is somewhat helpful for lightning. I mean, lightning is one of those things that if it's a big enough strike, nothing's gonna you know, protect you. But it is helpful in that it does tend to help some of that electricity go out the water where if there was no connection whatsoever. I have a question. All right, you first. <laughs> Yes. Why is that? I mean, if I put aluminum on my prop shaft and I have a zinc anode somewhere else underwater, you would think both of them would protect. The aluminum would dissolve faster than the zinc somewhere else on the boat. But you're saying I really should replace all of them to make them the same metal? It's better if they're all the same metal. The, the aluminum is actually going to protect the zinc. And so the aluminum is going to go away first right. you know, at a very rapid rate, and then the zinc will be left to protect everything else if there's you know, a lot of times when there's different things um, as part of the same, like, uh, for instance, uh, if you had a frigaboat system and it had a keel cooler um, and it had a, 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 a zinc anode on it, um, that little bitty zinc anode is, 
it, once the aluminum's gone off the back, it's going to try to protect the whole boat, and it's really, you know, it's it's not going to last either. So it's just going to exacerbate the corrosion and and potentially not there may not be enough metal to protect the boat throughout a whole season. Yeah, I could understand that if the, if the aluminum's completely gone, but you would think if I put the aluminum on the prop, that is the indicator of how fast or how much corrosion I prevented, and I wouldn't have to worry about the things <coughs> elsewhere in the water. But you're saying there's good reason to go around and replace them all. I don't know whether some of the other uh, anodes are zinc or not. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's one of those things that's such cheap insurance, and and you just you never know if something's going to come up and you're not going to be able to haul some gear. Um, you know, of course, you around here you've got access to divers and stuff that can that can uh, replace zincs in the water, but in the south. Uh, a, you know, a lot of those yards, people in like Charleston, for instance, we've got a yard down there and there's people that leave their boats in for five years. You know, they'll have just divers come around and scrape the bottom. Um, you can replace anodes underwater. Uh, I mean, I, depending on how well you can see what you're doing, you may be cleaning it off enough that you can get a good uh, anode bond when you, when you install the anode, but uh, uh, I don't know. I'm, I, I just, it's a big investment, right? And if the metal goes away, then that's, it's a huge cost, even to the point where, you know, I've seen boats sink because the, the, um, the anode was gone for a number of years and the through holes were eaten up and, and they started leaking. Yes, sir. So if I've got a boat that's got a, a whole boat protection system that I think is got a zinc plate on the bottom of the boat and I've got a refrigeration system that has a plate on the bottom of the boat, aluminum sail drive. I was advised to put aluminum on the sail drive because, but the other ones are zinc. They are for sure zinc? I, I, I thought they were zinc. Um, the, the, what I've read about it recommends that they all be the same. You know, what in practice happens when they're you know, if there's enough metal under the boat to corrode, um, I'd have to study that and see see what's going on. You know, if you're, if you're hauling out the boat and there's no corrosion issues and there's plenty of anode left at the end of the year, then it may not be an issue. My biggest corrosion issue is it, it pops the paint off the keel. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe switching to, well, okay, so this is a good point to say this. It is possible to have too much anode on. Um, like at some point, more is not better. And I'm kind of getting out of order. And there's a good picture to show you to check it. Protected on the system. So you have a, a corrosion meter. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's fallen right in the protected range. It says overprotected. Overprotected. Yeah, I've got a problem with the thing on the wheel. yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> Over over protecting can cause pain issues, for sure. Um, it's a real possibility. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So, um, it as long as it doesn't over. Uh, and of the boat like so you know it's not it's not horrible if when you first put the boat in the water and you're doing a corrosion check and it's just right on the upper edge of protected you know you don't really want it over protected but right on the edge of you know on the upper scale because you know you're going to lose anode as the as the uh, as it wears um, but if it's significantly in the overprotected range then that can be a problem um, so you may not need the, the guppy at the beginning after you've just done it, but if, you know, if it's a year and you don't know the condition of your anodes and you want to use it at that point, that certainly won't hurt anything. Um, yes, sir? Corrosion meter. Yeah. I'm going to jump ahead to find the corrosion meter. All right. So there's a device. Um, 
that's, it's basically, I mean, this is just a, uh, a multimeter, with, uh, you know, so it's, it's measuring uh, voltage. And at the other end of this probe, there's a little uh, through hole looking plastic thing that's got a silver, silver chloride reference cell in it. And basically there's alligator clips at both ends and you flip the reference cell into the water and you take the other end and you clip it to your bonding system or different points on the bonding system. And it will show, depending on the metal that you're reading, whether it's protected or not protected. So the little green segment says protect if you, if you can't read it from back there. The yellow on this side says freely eroding. The metal on this side says over protected. So it's actually showing where the needle is right now, uh, just under 900 millivolts. Um, so if this meter is helpful if you get in the water or you hauled out and you wondered, wow, everything really uh, corroded fast this year. It's a good idea to have us come down and grab that meter and clamp on the, the through holes and just make sure um, that it's in the right protected range. Also, if you're getting a leak from your, your bilge pump float switch, for instance, or, you know, if bilge pumps are, uh, centrifugal ones that sit down in the bilge that are submersible, if that ever, like a float switch hangs and the thing runs till it's dry, there's no water in it whatsoever, it's got an O-ring in it and that O-ring can heat up and melt it, and the pump will still work, but when it, water gets back in there again, you know, the water's gonna get up where the motor is and make it damp in there and that can also be uh, DC current. So, uh, a lot of times when we're doing this test, we'll turn on various DC devices aboard the boat, and if the meter spikes, then we know that we, you know, that's that device is causing a problem or its wiring is. Any correct questions about that? A quick question about yeah. the bonding. Um, um, I guess I really don't understand it. I saw like green uh, wires going to things. And I know green is always a ground, right? Yep. Yeah. So are these are every through hole has to have a ground to it? Yes. Ah. Yeah. That's that. what bonding is. Yeah. Okay. I I got ahead of myself. I you know, but the the basically the idea is that so it's similar to like, like in your house, the electric wires you always have on an outlet or anything a ground. Yes. Yes. And as a matter of fact, I'll get to that in a second. But the this green bonding wire at one point is also connected to the green ground wire or the safety ground on your AC system. It's also connected to the, the uh, DC ground. So your black wire going to your battery, your yellow wire going to your battery. So they're all at the same potential um, the, across the whole boat. Um, and is that why they can talk to one another and sort of affect each other? Yes, so you know if they're so you know the good news is that they're all the same potential and there's the protection from AC faults and and uh, from the anode. The bad news is if, if there is a fault, they're all connected together and you know potentially there's problems spread across the whole boat. And you said this is not standard in European boats. It's not. It's not. What so about a European boat made in South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen an awful lot of Benetos and Lagoons that do not have bonding systems. Yes? So, mine doesn't have a bonding system. What's the benefit? Like you said, like it, it can cause all of them to fail, but there's something to raise the problem. But so, put a bonding system in this area that has like a big vertical bonding system. There, there are benefits of the bonding system, as I eliminated um, in that old wood boat that I told you about. Um, that one, at some point when we weren't taken care of, somebody recommended that we put a bonding system on it. And what ended up happening is the zinc on the back actually caused the wood to sulfate. So all the fasteners in the boat started, they weren't part of the bonding system. So they started reacting and it actually was causing harm to the fabric of the boat. So all that had to come back off again. So there's applications where bonding isn't good. Like I would not put it on a wood boat. Um, 
you, my understanding is that that the European Union didn't think it was enough of a benefit for some reason to put it on, or the there you know all these rules are written by uh, manufacturers sort of. I mean, AUIC has insurance people representing it. It's got boat manufacturers representing it, and and they all get together and they go, well, you know this is pretty bad, we've had people die from this, and this is bad, people have died for this, let's write a rule around it. Um, same kind of things happening in Europe, the insurance companies saying, man, we're giving them, you know, all, all these boats are burning down because they're, they're not putting fuses in their electrical systems, we need to put a fuse in the electrical system, you know, that's how all those things get written. There must not have been as big a push to do bonding over there as what we've had over here, that's all I can guess. Half money system. <laughs> Is there any danger? Uh, it, you know, it's not protecting the things that are not part of the system. Yeah. Oh, lots of questions. Okay, yes, sir. Just quick, on, my boat has what is called a zinc saver. Yes. Okay, so I'm not real up on that particular device, but it's under, I'm under the impression well, there's two items on my boat that are not were not protected by bonding. And that is, or, or by Zinx, uh, it would be rudder and the shafts. When the manufacturer said it was not necessary. And I was also told that that Zinc saver was what was connected to those items. Would that be true or false, or what does the Zinc saver do? I'll get to the Zinc saver in just a second. Fine. That, that gets more into the uh, AC component of it, and, and another one of the downsides of a bonding system, and something that device is helping what we're talking about when we get to that. All right, hold that thought. Yes, sir. Well, if I'm testing my bonding system, I want less than an ohm of resistance, you know, on any length of wire. That is right, right, any connection. So, I mean, this is a nice, clean, new bonding system where, you know, each of these connections is on fresh, bright copper, or that's you know, a copper strap, um, and the connection on the, on the, Bronze itself is a nice clean connection. So that one meets the test. Also, just take a look at this nice flanged base and the backing block here that's spreading the load. Keep that in your mind because there's another picture here that doesn't look like that. Um, this is just showing the bonding system as it attaches to a rudder uh, pillar. So, uh, you know, they've got a coil of wire. So as the as the tiller moves back and forth, it's still part of the bonding system, and that's protecting the stainless steel shaft and the armature inside the rudder. Yes, sir? On the previous picture where you had the seacock, yes. uh, and we're talking about bonding, and I mean, the bonding, is the first slide I showed, was like how to protect devices that are connected to an electrical system from corrosion. Yes. So if this seacock is a standalone seacock, not attached to anything electrical in the boat, so this is a plumbing fixture, when we attach it, um, <clears throat> if we don't bond it, how is it part of the, the how's, how's it part well, of it's the not being, corrosion? it's not being protected by the zinc, um, but it's still immersed in seawater, which is an electrolyte. So if there's an electrical field that forms, it won't be protected. It, either your boat or the boat next to it, or you know the, the galvanized bulkhead that's beside you, any of those things. It'll still be part of a circuit. Sorry. No worries. Yes, sir? So I see that that photo, the, uh, the metal's been cleaned. It was recommended that it look like this all the time. <laughs> Um, so where the connection is, yeah, yeah, um, you know, we regularly go through boats and take them apart in that place, rub it with some uh, sandpaper or whatever, get it clean, put a little dab of uh, silicon grease on it, super lube or something like that, put it back together, um, and then check it again with the ohm reader, make, make sure that uh, we've got less than an ohm of resistance. Sandpaper or wire brush, you know, whatever's the fastest way to get it back to bright metal. Yeah. All right, so that was that one. Um, 
in this instance, the, I'm showing a shaft brush here. So there's a, a bar of metal that's running over to the bonding system and there's a, uh, there's a little carbon brush that's on the shaft. So when the shaft turns, it's protecting the shaft, keeping it in, in the bonding system. Now, a slip ring like this isn't the best way to make connections. Um, there's actually a, a pretty expensive slip ring system that, that it makes an even better shaft brush. But if there's, and the reason we're talking about this is because um, transmissions don't make the best electrical connection. They're, as the input shaft comes in, it's in an old fill area and there's bearings. So sometimes it's making a good connection, sometimes it's not. So in some cases, we'll have uh, anodes on the shaft, or maybe there's not a way to put an anode on the shaft if it's really short. You know, if the cutlass bearing is right up against the prop on the back of the keel, sometimes you can't get an anode on the, on the propeller, and you need to connect it to the bonding system in some other way. Um, that is a, uh, this is one way to go about it. This is not a good connection. <laughs> We were talking about cleaning things up, you know, it's, it's, a, it's in some, you know, for one thing, uh, you know, there was no bonding tab on, on this particular plumbing fitting, so somebody thought I could just whap it with a hose clamp, and, but when it gets cruddy like that, it's not making a connection, right? So it's not doing what it should. I don't know what this thing is, but, yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to get on my soapbox about... Uh, Seacocks versus through holes. Um, you know, any penetration in the hole is a through hole, but this is not a seacock. So, and the reason for that is ABYC has said that every through hole penetration needs to be able to withstand a 500 pound static force at its most vulnerable point. So, way up at the top, you should be able to stand on that, and two grown men should be able to stand on it and not have it snap off. This one will not meet that test. If, you know, if there's an anchor that gets loose in the boat and slides around or, or you, know, you go down and there's a, a vent in your engine room and you slip and you hit it, you're likely to shear that off at this point. And part of the reason for that is this is a straight thread. It's the only re way you can get a nut on it, right? You spin the nut on, it's a parallel sided plumbing fixture. This is meant it's tapered inside so it's got a shape like that so when you screw a straight thread into a tapered thread you're only getting a couple threads of engagement i mean it's it's very very minimal when you screw a straight thread into a seacock like uh, this picture the inside of this is straight threaded so you're getting that much engagement of uh, threads and it's a it's a much stronger connection um, along with that most of these have uh, three holes in them so they're getting screwed down into the base plate as well so when you you know if the thing has some barnacles in it and grab this handle you're not going to spin it you know the, the bolts are going to keep it from spinning on the through hole so um, some of the European boats also have this kind of uh, sea cop um, the other thing is, uh, uh, well, just the idea of stacking, even if this was a proper seacock, you don't want to have multiple plumbing things hanging on it. It just becomes more and more of a lever the longer it gets. So it's really better if coming out of the seacock, it's just an elbow or just a barb and you've got a hose that takes it to the whatever thing you want to connect to it, you know, a strainer or something. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, you know, you want to be able to shut it if you need to. Um, 
they do make a, 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 I've seen commercial versions of it. It's a little short piece of PVC pipe that's got a, a couple of slots in it to give you a little more leverage to move the handle. Um, you know, it, it's not a bad idea to go down once a month throughout the season and just actuate your through holes and make sure that they're not getting fouled um, because, uh, you know, if they're shut all the time, there's the, the ball in the seacock, uh, there's a chrome plated ball, it could get a barnacle on it that would make it very difficult to shut or, or any kind of hard growth can make it more difficult to shut. Just actuating them some helps solve that. And if it's really hard to move, you know, really the best thing is either to dive down there and clean it out or, or haul out the boat and, and get a pressure wash and just make sure it's okay. It's the prime directive of any boat owner, any boat yard is to keep the salt water on the outside, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the boats don't work very well if they're sitting on the bottom. So, uh, you know, you want to have that protection of having that valve to shut. And it needs to be a strong fitting, like this thing, like they've been, like a gate valve like that has been outlawed for quite a long time. But I don't know, there's still some boats from the 70s out there that probably have that. I don't know if any of you have ever gone to your home faucet and spun the, the handle and it just keeps spinning and spinning and spinning. It's not connected anymore. Well, that's really bad if, it's, if you're trying to stop seawater from coming in. Um, yeah. Here's our corrosion meter again. You guys are patient with me for getting out of order. What, what is that uh, probe you talked about? The yeah, it's 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 a it looks like a little plastic through hole, and it, inside of it there's a reference metal that's silver slash silver chloride, and it's just uh, there's a specific amount of it in there that they know will give you a certain reading, and then it's referenced by the the. Uh, uh, Can I just use a regular? VOM to do this, or do I have to have a specialized corrosion meter? You can have a VOM, but you have to have the the, the silver reference. silver chloride test cell. I've yeah. seen these reference probes. You can buy them. You can just buy the, that is very true. Now, Guest used to make this corrosion meter, um, and then there was a period of time where you couldn't find it, but I think I've, uh, we looked recently for one of the other yards, and there's a, somebody is making it again. But even through that time, you, I, I want to say we found it on Amazon, just a reference cell. Um, and as long as you know what's protected and what's not protected, then sure, multimeter would work just fine for that. Yeah. Yes, sir? The, this uh, scale seems to argue for the idea of having all your anodes the same metal. You know, because you're overprotecting some metals and underprotecting others. All the anodes should be the same metal. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, I mean, that thing kind of tells you that. You don't want to overprotect something mm -hmm. like if it's bronze. Where does your standard um, zinc fall on this scale? Well, Is it in the aluminum range or in the steel range? If, if, you've, if you've got all um, underwater... Uh, So like if, if you've got a boat that's got a stainless steel prop shaft and a navro uh, propeller and a bunch of bronze through holes, we're usually seeing it in, the, in this range, like right over here. So it's partly between steel and bronze. Well, what's a good reading? 600? So uh, like 700, 750 along in that range for fresh zincs on a boat. Yep. What's bad about over? So over overprotecting can cause issues with well, especially wood and aluminum boats or metal boats. It'll it's it's causing more voltage than what you want. So it's making it more reactive um, and more current flow through everything. And it'll actually cause problems with bottom paint or the wood of the boat or the, the metal hull. It'll pop the paint off the hull basically and then allow it to start to corrode once it's not, you know, with uh, aluminum especially, it's really important to keep barrier coats and uh, not have it exposed to the seawater as much as possible. 
Um, when, and same thing for an aluminum out drive or a sail drive, you want that paint coating to be very isolating. So you don't want to have any bare metal on aluminum under the water line. And partly it's because of that scale, that aluminum is so reactive that even with the anode on it, it's going to want to corrode. It's going to carry some of the, the protection for the vessel and, uh, and it will corrode away. Like bronze on fiberglass boats? No, co copper in, in the bottom paint. Oh, um, well, so if it's overprotected, the copper in the bottom paint will, will actually um, start to pop off. Yeah. And it's sometimes it's weird patterns. Like you can't always explain why, why it's modeled like it is until you do this test and you go, oh, you know, there's, for some reason, there's way too much zinc on this particular boat. Yes. <laughs> All right, so we've got our bonding system, and uh, this is a simple version of what's going on when we're plugged into shore power. All right, so we've got a black hot wire. This is a 30 amp uh, 110 system right here. We've got a black hot wire going to our microwave the neutral white wire so that the alternating current can alternate. The ground wire is not doing a thing. It's, it's not necessary for the circuit. And I, I mean, I can remember quite a few houses that just had two prongs in their electrical system. I'm sure you guys can too. Um, you know, it, it works great until there's a problem. You know, if you lose that white wire now and there's a, there's a fault somewhere, we're really good conductors, so, you know, that's why a lot of us know what it's like to be shocked. I can remember as a kid, my dad was, uh, he had a, a charcoal grill set up in the garage one day with uh, one of those, uh, uh, th thank you very much, yeah, so he had a chicken or something on it, and I was swimming in the, the little pool we had, and I came in dripping wet on the concrete floor, and I touched that thing. Well, I mean, I couldn't let go, right? It, it was it was an old two-wire thing, and the polarity was reversed on it, and it lit me up. So, uh, so it's a wonder I'm still here to this day. And I used to have really curly hair, and I don't know if that's <laughs> what happened. Or... Um, so this is a this is a good system. Everything looks good, and just remember that our engine is part of the bonding system, as is our prop shaft and, and all of our through holes. So if there's a problem. If the black wire, the hot wire in the electrical system chafes inside that microwave, it's sending some of that current into the bonding system. It's not, you know, there still is a bonding wire, so some of the current's going back to the shore ground because inside here, the neutral and the ground are connected together. So aboard a boat, and this is a really important point, there should be no neutral to ground connection anywhere on your boat. You want all that fault current to go back to shore where there's a big ground rod referencing it. Um, so if, if it's connected aboard your boat, you're negating this ground wire, or at least part of it. You know, again, the electricity is gonna take every path it can. It may take the least resistance, you know, some of the load's gonna be on least resistance, but some of it's gonna be on high resistance. Uh, paths like us, you know, we're a high resistance connection. So with that fault, some of that current's going into our engine and what it's gonna do, salt water's somewhat of a path, it's gonna fall, you know, follow some of the um, current back to that reference on shore. Um, and that's dangerous, right? If you jump in the water, you're in that electrical field and it's gonna, uh, paralyze your muscles and maybe cause you not to breathe uh, or take a big breath and, and choke. Yes, sir? I, I have um, two 50 amp circuits going into my boat. Each one goes to an isolation transformer. Mm -hmm. Those isolation transformers, they click a bit more than I would expect where they're boosting, which indicates some kind of an inconsistent power or power issue. I wonder if that could be related because I do have corrosion issues on my boat. So could that, could that be related? I, um, 
it's probably like the, the boosting is a matter of there's not enough current on the dock. And I mean, one of the things that's happened with boats is, you know, more and more air conditioners are going on, um, more and more electrical devices are going on. And it, in a lot of cases, it's exceeding what a uh, 50 amp cord can carry, especially when you put 49 boats on a, on a dock. You know, so there, there's a limit, like a lot of the, you know, Harrington Harbor is pretty good about it. They've upgraded their electrical system as the years have gone by. But if you go to some lesser docks, they may, you know, only have 40 amps available on a good day. And you put 12 boats on there and they're all running their electrical system. You know, they're going to drop it down as maybe 90 volts or whatever. So a boosting transformer is an excellent way of boosting that and, and not harming your stuff. But the other thing an isolation transformer is doing is it's got two coils in it, and that's how transformers work. So there's current going through this coil, the shore side, and then there's it's inducing voltage on the other side of the coil, but there's no physical connection. You know, there's an air gap there. So um, as any fault current isn't going to try to go back to shore. It's going to go within the boat's electrical system. Now, if there's a fault in some of your wiring so that some of it's leaking into the bonding system. It won't try to go to shore, so it's not dangerous for a swimmer, but it could still be causing an electrical field around your boat. I mean, I'm not saying that's what's happening, but, but it is a possibility. All right, so if there's a really big ground fault, now the, the water is carrying all of the current because this ground has been severed there's no possibility of it going back on the neutral. It all has to go on the, through the water. That's a really big AC leak, and it's really dangerous for anybody in the water. Um, yes, sir? Is that what you have the GFI circuit? Yeah, circuit? yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, in an effort industry-wide to try to not have people keep dying from getting electrocuted, we've pushed for not only a, a ELCI system on the shore, but an ELCI whole boat system on the boat, as well as GFCIs at each individual outlet. And they've all got different um, ampere ratings, or milliamp ratings at which they trip. Um, let's see, I think we're going to get to that. It's got to be one in every outlet? Yes, yes. So, um, a GFCI trips at 10 milliamps. Is that right? Does that sound right, 10 milliamps? <laughs> the, the shore has to be at 100 milliamps and then 30 milliamps on the boat itself. So uh, they've got different, actually, I think GFCI is maybe five. Let me say that again. So they're, they're a lesser rate. They're, they're protecting the person. The, the whole boat ones have to carry more of a fault, so they're higher, and the dock itself has, is even higher than that because it's dealing with the cumulative leaks on every boat. Um, it's unusual to get to a boat that doesn't have any leak at all, but it, it may be very small. The problem comes when there's 20 boats on a dock and they all have a very small one. You know, we're trying to protect the whole string. Um, let me see if I get to that. Is this causing any corrosion issue, or is this just a danger issue of swimmers? A big enough leak like this over a period of time will cause corrosion. Um, it's, there was a, uh, I think I started out saying, you used, they used to say that AC never caused any corrosion, but then there was an oil pipeline um, study that actually showed that some of those long iron pipes that carry oil and there's electrical lines over the top of them, um, actually, it will, it will induce some uh, corrosion on the pipe itself. So, uh, but it's it's not as quick as what a DC leak would do. And it's a cumulative and based on the amount of current that's going into it. Uh, uh, excuse me. Yes. So we're talking about 110 here now, right? The electric using a short cord. AC current. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. So. Yep. Knowing that, in home construction, you'd have one GFI yeah, in a right, water right. area, like let's just say a kitchen. Uh huh. Then the other ones could just be regular outlets. You can certainly do that. If they're on the same circuit. Yep. No, you said that on boats, each individual outlet should have 
It's on the circuit breaker. Well, um, or GFI. So everything in the stream, if it's protected by that GFCI, that's fine. Okay. Yes, I mean you're you're trying you're going for the end result of not having um, you know somebody be electrocuted. So you could certainly have one GFCI at the beginning of a stream, and it could even be a GFCI breaker that protects everything on that stream. Um, some boats will put a GFCI breaker on everything on that stream, just because it can be a pain if let's just say the there's a GFCI in the galley and it trips and you're in the shower or you know in the bathroom blow drying your hair now you got to go out and you got to trip it in the galley you know right. um, yes sir and this diagram i don't understand how a microwave on a 110 volt system is connected to the engine i don't think my boat has that connection so um if the outlet that the microwave is attached to has a ground which it should that ground um is connected to the electrical panel and in the electrical panel there's, there's a connection to the DC ground, which is also connected to the bonding system. I don't think my 110 is connected anywhere to the DC system. I thought that was ABYC was no connection between 110 volt and a DC system. No, there's actually, you want all of the bonding system and the AC ground and the DC ground all connected at one point on, on the boat. And you can confirm that if you, if you got a multimeter, shut off all your power, turn off all the battery switches and unplug from the shore, stick your multimeter in the ground pin of one of the outlets and then connect it to the, the, the bonding system and you should have a connection there. Right. And, and it's a safety issue. You know, you, you want all those things at the same potential in case there's a fault. One more question. Are, oh, I'm sorry. Someone asked a question about an isolation transformer. Yeah. But then there's another device that's called a voltage isolator, I think it is. It's not transformer. It's a, it's a bunch of diodes in a... That's right. Yeah. It's, and it's the galvanic I, isolator. I was going to ask you, are you going to talk about this? Yep. Yep. So let's, let's talk about this scenario. Um, we got our dock. We got every boat plugged in. They all have bonding systems or, you know, underwater metals, potentially with a connection from the green ground of the AC to the bonding system, they're all connected electrically at this point. Um, so if there's a fault on one boat, uh, you know, if you've got aluminum underneath your water, it's gonna become the anode for everything on the dock once, once the anodes are gone. Um, so how do we solve that? With a galvanic isolate. So, um, there's a couple of these on the market. I'm really partial to the uh, DEI fail-safe ones, but ProMariner makes a good one. Um, you talked about a zinc saver. It's another version. The, the important thing with a galvanic isolator is that it be fail-safe. Like it needs to say somewhere that if the thing dies, it's still gonna make that connection. There, there are versions of these out there that when they fail, they fail open and now you don't have a bonding connection, which is, is dangerous. Um, they're simple to install. I mean, basically what you're doing is you're, uh, you're installing it before any other device on the boat on the green wire. So you, you snip this wire, you put two ring terminals on it, you stick the isolator in. And it's just a series of uh, diodes so that Current flows one way, but not the other way. And, uh, and it allows AC current to flow through it, which you want in both directions, but it does it blocks the DC current from a potential fault from all the boats on the dock. How do you, how do you test uh, to see if it's working? Yeah, so um, uh, there, each one of those devices is gonna come with a, a manual or you can find a manual online and there's, they all have test procedures in those manuals. But basically you take a multimeter and you put it on ohms and you, you multimeters are, when they're checking ohms, they're di directional. So you're going from negative to positive. So you connect it to the two studs and you have continuity one way and then you flip it the other way and you shouldn't have continuity or, or a listed value of resistance going the other direction. Um, so they're, they're pretty simple to test and I, I do recommend doing it once a year, you know, just to make sure. Now the galvanic isolator is in the ground circuit, right? Right. The ground wire is not in the two hot wires. 
That is right. It is in the ground wire. And, you know, in, in, in a good, in a, in a normally functioning boat with no faults at all, the ground wire shouldn't carry, the AC ground water shouldn't carry any current at all. I mean, it's just there if there's a fault somewhere else. It's not necessary for the circuit. And frankly, we don't want any current on it. There shouldn't be current on it. But um, there's been enough people shocked over the years to recognize that the need for it is there. And it, and it certainly saves lives. So I have one of these gun It's an old one, doesn't have any indicator on it. Mm -hmm. I've chosen to use a, a it's like a household um, GFI circuit tester to validate that it can actually get to ground. Is that good enough to maintain the test? I do the other test for voltage one direction or the other every year. Yeah, that's a surprise. <laughs> but I got buttons to fix that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, is that good enough? Um, the the, um, the multimeter test is all that the manufacturers were, you know, recommend. Um, so, I, you know, for a while, ABYC said that there had to be a, a visual um, device, and there were a number of galvanic isolators out there at the time that you had to run a wire from the isolator up to the helm, and it it was slowing adoption because you go from something that should take a couple hours to install to something that should take, you know, that might take 12 hours to run a wire from the stern to the helm or whatever. Um, they just felt like the, the, uh, the visual reference wasn't worth the, the trouble. Now, I think you can buy some of these if you, with, with the visual indicator, if you still want to do that. Well, it used to be required. I think they dropped the requirement, but you, you can still do it if you want to, but I don't know, they're pretty rugged devices. It's, I, I, I've seen a couple of Zinc Saber, somebody here was talking about Zinc Saber. Um, I've seen a couple of those fail over time, but I haven't ever seen the other two versions. You know, I've checked them, quite a few of them over the years and not seen them fail. Um, so I think it's pretty rare that there's a problem with them. But again, you know, it's doing an important job, so it's it's a good idea just to make sure it's working like it should. Um, this is just showing the. Um, uh, okay, so Victron makes one as well, and it's, it shows the circuit path there of the diode setup and and then the location of where you put it. it just needs to be before any other connection on the boat, so relatively close to the inlet, or if you know that the wire from the inlet is, there's nothing else connected to it before it goes to your, where your electrical panel is. It could be behind where the electrical panel is. Um, sometimes they can be pretty well hidden. Um, you know, it can be a bit of a challenge to find them on some boats. If, it, if for some reason uh, somebody stuck it behind a, a, a panel, you know, tucked away, but it's a good idea to check for it. Yes. Um, I've got the ELCI breakers on the 230 amp circuit on my boat. Yes. I had the breakers on one of the service quit trip twice during the summer. I can't figure out what you could possibly find. What should I be looking for? Is it straight current or something? Um, it can be stray current that trips them. I mean, that's what they're designed to do, is to trip the stray current. It can also be if the voltage drops too low, like if there was a brownout on your dock, um, They'll, they'll sometimes trip um, if there's too much load as well. I mean, it may be just be working like the breaker that it is. Uh, yeah, if there's no load on your boat. Yeah, Pardon me? Just a charger. Just a charger. Yeah, it's, it's probably not. Um, it can, the, you know, if there's a problem with one of the devices on the boat where it's, uh, you know, gotten damp or the internals or something, there's an internal problem, a bad solder joint or something, that'll sometimes cause them to trip. Um, what about a lightning? For sure, lightning can cause a problem. For sure. <laughs> Any kind of coupling. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know, every year, unfortunately, you know, a number of boats that we care for gets hit by lightning, and, and it's such an insidious thing. Uh, you know, from the, you know, as simple as the aerials winding up on deck to, you know, fires that take the whole boat out. Um, 
And sometimes, you know, it will be really obvious some of the devices that fail, but sometimes, and you'll, and you'll fix those devices, and then three months later, you know, you'll get this cascade of several other devices, including electrical panels. I mean, all, the, all your breakers have a little bimetallic strip in it. You know, it's a little piece of metal that's meant to trip when there's enough of a load. Those can all be damaged by a big enough lightning strike. So. Um, <laughs> Sail <on> a zigzag. <laughs> you know, it, I don't know. Pray. <laughs> um, so, if ABYC for a while had a standard for lightning protection, and they, you know, they wanted a lightning rod of some sort, which could be your mast with a a rod at the top of it. Um, power boats had it harder. They wanted you actually install a, a lightning mast with a four gauge wire at the bottom of it that went straight down to a, a, a plate of some sort or the keel. Um, and then every other medical, uh, every other metal device on the boat, handrails, shrouds, all with big conductors going down to that single electrical point to try to take that blast and get it to the water as quick as possible. And in that also, you're setting up a Faraday cage, which has given the human beings on board the boat some protection. They moved it from a requirement or a recommendation to just a white paper, because it was just incredibly expensive to retrofit boats with this, and, and it was incredibly expensive for manufacturers to maintain it, and they weren't really seeing enough evidence that it was really working. If it's a big enough strike, it's going to do whatever it wants. I mean, it's it's going to it's going to destroy stuff. And um, you know, I can say, did yours get hit by lightning? <laughs> no, 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 no. Two two part question. I was yeah. once told that if you're sailing, and I'm a, right now I'm, I'm on sailboats, mm -hmm. um, take your jumper cables, clip them to your shrouds, and drop drop the other end in the water. Yeah, I've heard that so, too. Uh, and I'm wondering. First of all, is that a good idea, or does that make you more of an attractive ground? <laughs> uh, you know, the thing about it, and you know, there's been there's it's big business trying to come up with a way to prevent buildings and you know things that are outside, and especially Florida, where it's such a lightning hotspot, from being damaged by lightning. You know, great big cables that go to the ground is is the best thing. So if there's a lot of lightning in the area, at least the lightning's gonna got the best path possible. But it's not just the lightning itself; it's the EMP pulse. You know, the there's so much. I mean, it acts like a transformer. There's so much electricity that other wiring ten boats down the way are seeing that magnetic force and. You know, it can cause problems with the electronics, or you know, it, it's going to try to get to the ground too. Well, so, the EMP pulse isn't going to hurt a human. It won't hurt a human. No, no, unless you have a pacemaker. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, what do you do? I, you know, try to get away from the metal as much as you can. Uh, if you've got electronics, I've heard that if you stick them in your your metal stove. You know, if they're the type that can be disassembled and stuck in there, or at least your spare GPS, stick that in there. Uh, your phone and your, your watch or whatever, get that inside of the, you know, a Faraday cage, which a, a metal stove would, would do, and just kind of hunker down, hope that nothing happens. Hopefully you'll be okay and be able to, you know, continue to sail or, you know, have the phone to call for help or whatever. Um, of course, you're far enough out, you're self-rescuing, but... Um, yeah, it's, it is a little bit scary because there's not so much that you can do. Yes, sir? I'll just say, we used to sail small boats in Colorado, mm -hmm. and they would build up the chart in the afternoon, thunderstorm, so I could walk up to the trailer and pull a three-inch spark. So we started hooking one of the trailer chains to a shroud and let the other drop on the ground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if your boat's ashore and you ground the shroud, you'll keep from building up a static charge on your rig. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's dispersing. That might induce the lightning and hit the next guy over and not 
And my kid just moved to Colorado and went to visit, and I was amazed at how dry it was out there. And sparks-wise, you know, it, it was a different, it's, it's way different. We got so much moisture in the air around here that there's less of the air static charge, except for lightning, yeah. Well, that's the presentation as a whole. I'm happy to talk about anything else if I missed anything, if you've got you know, additional questions. Um, yes, sir? Uh, aluminum hull boats. Any, any specific uh, things outside of what you've already mentioned to address uh, issues with aluminum hulls? You know, that you're going to want anodes on them, you know, protecting the hull, and you're going to want the paint system for underwater to be, you know, a good, high-quality epoxy paint system just so that the whole structure itself is, is uh, isolated. Uh, you know, isolation for aluminum is, I, I've said it before, but it's so important that the paint system, the manufacturers do a really good job of painting their, their, their uh, devices when they start out. Over time, as barnacles get on them and we're scraping on them, we're cutting into their paint. Like you just don't want any bare metal whatsoever on your, uh, on your aluminum under the water. Get it painted back up with a good system and isolate it. That does help with corrosion. Yes. Sir. So back to the, the mixed anodes. Yes. Uh, so onboard, you know, that's where we've got aluminum out, outboard. You know, outboard. Yes. Seawater's like there. There's enough. It's enough of a isolated uh, uh, environment that it, it it doesn't cause an issue if it's a different zinc or a different anode inside the boat than outside the boat. Um, there's enough electrical separation. I mean, you've, you've got hoses and things that are, you know, it's just not a big. A, there's not enough current to go through the hose to cause a connection. Yeah. Yes, sir. Back to the It may be. It may just be um, a little bit more anode than you need um, in that plate. That's where the, the meter would help show that whether or not it's too much. I mean, there's a real balance. Um, like on the transom. No, 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 not the transom. It's in the hull of the boat. Okay. And is it an anode or is it just metal? No, it's not an anode, it's just your bounding or your grounding, bonding plate. Inside the boat? It's outside the boat. It's on the outside of the boat. And it, of course, it comes through with connections for your wiring. Is it, is it, a, um, is it a centered bronze yeah. piece? Okay, okay, I follow you. Yeah. So uh, a lot of boats for a long time came with uh, a, a centered bronze, uh, as you're saying, a grounding plate, and it was great for single side bands and Lorans. Um, VHFs it gave a, a stronger uh, uh, connection to uh, the seawater and helped with uh, projection of, of uh, radio signals. Um, so it, it may be that there's some elect electrical activity that's causing some uh, paint loss in that area. Um, that, that's my best guess for that. Interesting, interesting. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it could be that, like, do you have a single side band aboard? No. No. So I, I have seen issues with single side bands, um, may not be directly related to you, but when you keyed the mic, there was electricity going to the ground plane, it's just part of the, the way it works. And on those boats, sometimes I was seeing some electrical activity around the, the ground plane itself. Um, and especially if the radio had gotten wet or something, you know, there, there might be more of leakage down that way. Could be that maybe the VHF is, is causing a little bit of leakage. Um, it could be that there's, um, you know, when you start out, there, you, maybe you have a little bit too much anode, and so there's extra electrical activity, and that's one point where it's touching the seawater. So the you know, you're in that field. Yes, sir. Have you seen any 
you have any experience with uh, electric motors causing particular issues? Um, I haven't seen them direct re directly related to um, DC leaks. Uh, they have more batteries. You know, any, any device that has a shaft that's underwater all the time has the potential for the seal to eventually fail. And if, if some amount of moisture, you know, I'm not saying like a wholesale failure, but if some amount of mo moisture can get into the windings of the motor, then when the motor's running, you know, some electricity is going to come out of it. Um, kind of depends on what that the leg is made out of, if it's plastic or aluminum, you know, how much damage that might cause. Um, ultimately, you know, we don't want to mix the electricity in the water as much as possible. Yes, sir. Uh, we were looking at the pictures of the uh, corrosion with the through holes and, and the shafts and all. Yeah. Is that industry looking at these as... Like making the device out of carbon fiber? Absolutely. Um, I haven't seen any carbon fiber through holes yet. Uh, Same thing with shafts. Uh, nor shafts. I mean, certainly they're... Ah, yeah, right? <laughs> it's a good question. Now, I have seen issues with um, carbon mass and bonding and lightning um, because it's not a great conductor, so you know you do want to get a, a bonding wire inside the carbon mass so that you know in a lightning strike it does have something that it can carry the current down in. Um, but it just you know, surprises the, me that the uh, plastics industry is completely ignoring this whole business. It is. It is interesting. I you know that's a really good question. I. I I don't know if it may be in that it's difficult to machine like the keyway in a shaft or the threads in a shaft if it's made out of carbon fiber, um, such that you know would actually hold a prop on it. Shafts are, you know, they, uh, there's different ways to attach props and couplings, but if you look at the the prop end, there tends to be a taper, there tends to be a keyway cut in it, and when you put the propeller on. The propeller also has an inverse taper, so it's shoving it up on the shaft. So you, if you put a prop on properly, you don't even need the nut, right? It's it's the stretching the metal, and then the metal is is captured on the on the taper. I, I don't know if it applies here, but at least for a bicycle, carbon fiber is known to give a little bit mm -hmm. more so than steel. So I don't know if that would be a factor for a marine application. Yeah, I, I, I mean, they're making F1 cars out, you know, whole parts of it. So it, it is an interesting idea. I but it was I, as strong as steel. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question. Yes, sir. So in the $10 million price range, I think Revivovich is making sport fish with titanium shafts. Titanium? And titanium, like everything. But you're talking mega bucks for, for this sure. stuff. For It'll sure. never break, mm -hmm. you know, but it's not in the... I guess nobody here has a $10 million boat. I don't know. But. You know, there's there's a lot of uh, titanium sailboat fittings now, that, mm -hmm. and they're you know they're more mass produced. Right. They're 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 still but expensive. Shafts, you know, shafts and power stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, Dave Gurr is a well-known marine engineer, and uh, he's his favorite shaft is Monell, mm -hmm. which is uh, more copper based. Uh, it's still a little bit softer than stainless steel, but you know he he feels like that's Worth the money, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. That you're not connected to the other boat's DC problems on the dock, so it, it'll allow an AC fault current okay. out. I don't know that every single um, galvanic isolator is set up with that particular yeah, wiring diamond. Pardon me? I believe it works, but yeah. I, I'm not grasping that. 
Yeah, it, it, I, I suspect that they're different value diodes. Um, so it, it's all, each diode drops 